everyone, so I am here shooting a lunar eclipse. Hi. This is Matt. Hey. He's just watching. The, all of these guys came out when the moon finally turned red, which is somewhere up there. It's actually kind of too dark. Actually, Billy, we were out in front of the chapel. How were you? The, almost the entirety of the eclipse. Yeah. What you guys may not realize is how much work actually goes into recording a lunar eclipse. You know, before I just used my gimpy little camcorders to zoom all the way in and just adjust the camera every five minutes. So, but this time, I'm actually, I, I finally have a telephoto lens and I just bumped it. Okay. Oops, maybe it's time for me to readjust it. I should probably check to see that the focus is still good. Ah, uh, such a party picture, but I think the focus could very well be off. Okay, I think it got focus. So, time to readjust. All right, and then I've got this handy dandy little intervalometer that holds the shutter down, and that allows me to take pictures continuously. Unfortunately, the interval, the interval um, part of the intervalometer. The intervalometer? doesn't work. That thing. So only the shutter release does, thank hey, goodness. Hey, the only reason why it doesn't work is because it has no batteries. Well, that too. What I have is a shutter set to four seconds, and my aperture is open all the way, and my ISO is set to 200. So when I started shooting, I had it at two seconds. Um, my ISO was all the way down to 100. The aperture was all the way closed at, at 45. S stop. So I, it was really tough to transition between the two, so it'll be very interesting to see how the time lapse looks. Billy's working on something. But um this this is his uh makeshift card reader. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure it's just like a card reader from an actual computer. Yep. That he took out and uh And then I got this little USB adapter for it on which, which also looks very dangerous and could be electric. This is only five volts. There's nothing to it's, worry about. It's only five volts straight to your heart. Yeah, there's not much to see through that camera. This is why I'm using a DSLR and not a camcorder to film it. Yeah, so it's going very well. My dad let me borrow his telephone lens. It's just a it's just the cheap EF 75 to 300 Canon lens, so it's not that sharp, but it'll do for now. All right, so the disadvantage with using 8 gig and 4 gig compact flashcards, these things are such ancient technology, is the picture's about to run out. Go. Let it finish buffering. Run, okay, hurry. I'm hurrying. Run, belly, run. I'm hurrying. I mean, there's not a whole lot of changes. There's not a whole lot of changes. You don't know this to the moon. All right, reposition. It is so dim in the viewfinder. So here are some of the raw photos that I took at the beginning of the night. This is just when the eclipse was starting. Actually, let's wait, let's go back. So I did leave it a bit overexposed because I wanted the shutter to open for two seconds so I wouldn't be taking thousands of pictures because otherwise it would go kaplik, kaplik, kaplik. Instead, this was going kaplik. So fortunately, since this is raw, I can just turn down the exposure. That is kind of fuzzy. So, but there it looks nice and sharp. So that's the disadvantage with using like an only $150 lens. There's that blood moon. There it is. Oh man, yeah. The shutter was way too fast there. See the shutter was four seconds and you can see the star is kind of blurry. So I'm not gonna be able to zoom it in much. All right, so now what I'm trying to do is increase my shutter speed slowly as the moon gets a bit brighter and brighter that way the moon will look sharper because I think I thought two seconds would be plenty to get the moon in sharp. But when I get really nice and close up, it just looks ever so blurry. And I notice there's little stars next to it that also have some streaks. So as it gets brighter, which it now is on the other side, I will be able to get a sharper moon. Hopefully I have to keep my ISO kind of high, which is unfortunate. So the eclipse just finished up. It looks like there's slight, there's a very slight shadow on the right side of it, but for the most part, it's done. So this, this round of compact flash cards has been filled up, so I'm just gonna call it quits now. All right, so I've imported all of the pictures into Lightroom now, and the first thing that I had to do was to do my best to de-flicker the images. Since this was, you know, with a DSLR and it doesn't handle exposures nearly as well as a camcorder does, I had to go in and try to n fix what I can. So anyway, I've got this picture near the end of the time lapse, and my f-stop was at f11. And then right here during this next frame, I went ahead and brought down the exposure by minus 0.1. And then when I went to the next frame, where it jumps to f13, I went ahead and did a plus 0.1 before finally going back to zero. 
So every time I adjusted the aperture, it would bring the exposure down in the image. So after the adjustment, I had to bring up the exposure, and before the adjustment, I had to bring down the exposure to kind of smooth it out. And so going through this painstakingly long process, it did help. You can see that it did, um, that the exposure did smooth down quite a bit. Um, pardon the jerks every time, you know, I adjusted the camera. So it took a long time. It would be nice if I had some software to do that for me automatically. But now that that's out of the way, now I was able to go in and motion track it. So I've got the image here in After Effects and I imported it as a 60 frame per second sequence so that helped speed it up a little bit more because I had plenty of frames because I couldn't set a separate interval apart from my shutter speed. And so after I brought this in here, I imported it into a sequence and I did a very rough correction by hand. You can see all of, all of these paths that I drew to try to keep the moon as close as I could to the center. But after I did that, then I was able to let After Effects motion track it, and that's what the second sequence is for. Here, let me get rid of this timer mapping really quick here so that I can show you the, the motion stabilization. So yeah, I just tracked it all the way through, and fortunately I was able to keep it on there pretty well, and there were some times that it got off and I had to reposition it, but for the most part this strategy worked pretty well. And, oh, do you guys see that right there? There's like some little things going in front of the moon. And what that actually is, is just dust on the image sensor. I mean, it looks like satellites or something going by. But as you can see on the time lapse here, where before I did any stabilization, you can see the sensor dust right there on the video. See, right there? So, and it looks still. And so that's one problem with letting your image sensor get dirty and also when you close the aperture that's the only time it's when it's revealed so it's easy to forget about sometimes so anyway back to the motion tracking so after i got this this pretty much locked the moon in place except i needed one more step i needed to go and painstakingly keyframe the rotation so i had to make sure that the anchor point was right in the center and then i went in through because without the rotation keyframes that's when it, um, the moon rotated on its own, and it just kind of looked a little wonky. So that's something that I had to work with a little bit there. And anyway, moving on to the next sequence, this is when, so the moon is nice and stabilized here. It did a pretty good job, and, but there were, there was a slight problem by me adjusting the shutter speed. When I went from four seconds to two seconds, that made the time lapse go much slower. So I had to add some time remapping keyframes over here to keep the speed consistent. But here, this is when I put the last final touch on it. As you can see here in the time lapse, the, the Earth's shadow kind of moves on. It kind of looks like it's coming on at a crooked angle and then it comes doesn't come on completely the other side of the moon, and that's because the moon didn't go straight through the center of the Earth's shadow. It went down at an angle like this. So I wanted to kind of visualize that by adding some final motion to the end of it here. So I drew this circle to simulate the Earth's shadow, and then I just did a slight position keyframe to go all the way across, so that way you can kind of make out where the Earth's shadow is. And I. This gives some really nice depth to it. And this also keeps any stars that might be visible um, fairly stationary. You can kind of see that there's one wiggling over here on the left. So if you can, if I can get a, the stars perfect all around it, that's when it would look the best, when you're completely taking the Earth's rotation out of the equation. So now that that's all done, you guys can now enjoy the complete time lapse.
So I hope you guys have a greater appreciation for everything that goes into a time lapse like this. Now, I have a nice telephoto lens that this one only zooms in to 150 millimeters, but it is much sharper than the 300 millimeter I was using before. So not only will this mean that I won't have to adjust my camera as much because this is a wider lens, but it'll also mean that I can zoom way in and get a sharper image of the moon. But the next lunar eclipse isn't for a couple of years, so I'll have to wait on that. But I'll be ready! <laughs> so if you guys enjoyed this video, I invite you guys to check out some of the other lunar eclipses I've made in the past. They're not that great because I was just using, you know, my gimpy little camcorders for them, but, you know, I, they're still fun to watch, and it's my first one. Ugh, I'm motion tracked completely by hand because I didn't have After Effects at the time and that was such a thing. But anyway, so you guys can check those out if you want. And you can even subscribe to be notified of future videos. Thanks for watching.